It's always like old home week at Special Collections at Plattsburgh State. We've been here many times with our good friend Wayne Miller, and we're back again for special subject matter. Wayne, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Gordon. I really think we should have taken some pictures of of Wayne in his native attire. <laughs> he had the biggest pair of muckalucks and a heavy coat on, but, you know, he had a long ways to go through the snowstorm. We're filming this in late January 2002, one of the most bizarre seasons I've ever seen in my years. Well, and, and we don't know from one hour to the next what we're going to get. We haven't from had one minute anything. to the next well, on the way you were driving up here. Yeah. Well, I get to go over all kinds of terrain between here and Malone. Oh, so. Lordy. But we're here on a Saturday morning to talk about subjects that we haven't covered before. Although uh, this Rockwell Kent collection here at Plattsburgh State is among the finest in the world. Well, for research materials, yes, uh, uh, the R. Kent collection is one of the, the most important collections that does exist, even though we're tucked away in the North Country. And in combination with the Kent Gallery, um, we really do have uh, a wealth of, of Rockwell Kentiana. So this brings people from all over the place. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And and it also uh, is a place for people who want to, who own Kent related materials to make them available for researchers. Well, you got something very special going on now. Well, we do, yes. There's a show opening today uh, with the works of relatives of Rockwell Kent. And um, we have with us, and we'll be speaking uh, soon with, with someone who uh, is expert on Kent and has uh, explored um, the artistic uh, uh, endeavors of uh, the Kent extended family. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very interesting to see the relationships, uh, not only uh, uh, familiar relationships, Relationships, but artistic relationships between those uh, that group of people. I think it's important for people to leave their television sets on for a while. This is one of those wonderful programs that has no commercials. <laughs> You'll get a chance to sit here and sneak out. It'll be brought rebroadcast again now and at some time in the future on your neighborhood cable systems here in northern New York. But I dare say, and this is something you and I talked about before the cameras rolled, that there aren't very many people who are watching now who know very much of the story of Rockwell Kent. Well, he was a fascinating figure, both as a as an artist and as a, a human being. He, uh, of course, was politically active and uh, um, engendered a great deal of strong emotions uh, for his political beliefs. To uh, say the uh, least. Uh, and as a as a a, a wonderful artist, uh, he also engendered a great deal of strong emotions. Uh, and as time passes, more and more of those emotions are are positive. And and there seems uh, to have been a a, uh, a re-evaluation of Kent the artist over the past uh, couple of decades and his uh, star has been on the rise. Um, during the 1930s he was very well known as a book illustrator and uh, he did a great deal of wonderful advertising copy uh, that uh, is not generally known about. The gallery did a show about that a, a couple of years ago. Uh, many people have seen at least some of his paintings or, or really distinctive uh, line drawings. And of course the Kent Gallery upstairs uh, displays those. Um, but he was a, a longtime resident uh, of uh, his farm Asgard just outside of uh passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, so they have a long association with the North Country, and uh, many people in the region have various wonderful anecdotes to relate about Kent. Uh, um, he also became involved in, in lots of other uh, businesses. He opened a bed and breakfast. He ran a, a, da <laughs> a, da on, a dairy farm. Uh, right, he started a, tried to start a dairy, ran it for a while, but uh, um, had some problems, largely political, because of his political beliefs. He was. Uh, not all that uh, popular as a businessman uh, in, in the North Country. Um, and he developed a special relationship with the college shortly before his death. Uh, and we are really pleased that um, he chose Plattsburgh State to uh, be a repository for a good deal of his work. When I say people don't know much about Rockwell Kent, I don't think they know how many facets he had. We all have more than one, but this guy had 
it was so many things at so many different times oh, in his yes. career. Well, he does, not, just in the area of design, I mentioned uh, uh, advertising copy uh, and book illustration, which he was a uh, premier book illustrator in the 1930s, book plates, um, tableware, dishes, wrapping paper, distinctive designs. He did a, a number of uh, Christmas seals. Uh, oh, uh, I forgot the Christmas seals. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge uh, uh, picture hanging in the student union down the hall of one of his uh, I can't remember, Christmas seal or Easter seal um, illustrations uh, that he did. And he was also a writer. He wrote several books, most of them autobiographical. Uh, but he was he was an author as well, and was very politically active, uh, and and not just uh, in a headline grabbing way, but in a way that he really tried to to help uh, uh, working people and uh, uh, with some success, which of course got him into some hot water as as political pendulums swung to and fro uh, from the 30s through the 50s and and he ended up on the uh, uh, on the on the blacklist in essence uh, was uh, uh, taken to task by the US government had his passport removed this is an old story uh, but he but he was not one to sit down and, and uh, uh, allow allow the government to do something to him that he didn't believe was right so I will never forget that anecdote you told me about We'll tell it. Well, he's, uh, <laughs> there, there's a wonderful shot uh, of newsreel footage of, of uh, Rockwell Kent standing on the steps of the Supreme Court as his uh, case, Kent versus the United States, is being decided where um, he was trying to get his passport back. He had tried to uh, uh, get a visa to go to England to teach, and the State Department had uh, lifted his passport. Uh, and he's standing on the steps of the Supreme Court, and he's saying, uh, reminds me of the uh, farmer uh, who uh, was, uh, and I'm paraphrasing very, very, very liberally here, whose uh, wife didn't like him running around so much, so she took his pants. He says, um, uh, I feel like I've had my pants taken. I want my pants back. <laughs> so he was going to the Supreme Court to get his pants back. That's the and he line. did. And of course, the first thing he did once he got his passport back was go and visit the Soviet Union. And this is uh, in the late 1950s. Uh, and this made him, a, of course, a hero uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, along with their appreciating his very uh, uh, his art that very much uh, celebrated the working person. Um, he uh, uh, was awarded later in the 1960s the, the Lenin Peace Prize, which was uh, the Soviet Union's um, highest civilian honor. And uh, there's there's great footage of his uh, his trip there. Uh, to the Soviet Union, and the largest collection of his art is in the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia now, again. And Rockwell Kent was a, a, a strong personality who outlived many of his detractors. <laughs> yes, he lived to a ripe old age, uh, and uh, he continued to work uh, throughout his life. Uh, and uh, w but once he developed his distinctive style, he was very true to that uh, through his life. I'm, I'm not a, a uh, an art critic, but uh, it does not take one to uh, just observe uh, the art that he produced. And uh, once you have uh, seen some of his work, you instantly recognize it. There are there are those people who once you once you are exposed to their to their vision. Um, it's very distinctive, and uh, you, you can immediately recognize it, even if the subject matter is new. In a few minutes, you're going to meet Scott Ferris, an alumnus of Plattsburgh State who's uh, spent much of his life thinking about, talking about, uh, and demonstrating the, the various kinds of uh, art that Rockwell Kent was involved in. We'll look at some paper things that are kind of neat in a little back room, and we'll talk about generations on our little corner. We have a very interesting Rockwell Kent collection in this room, Scott Ferris. Hello, and Gordy. How are I'll, you doing? I'm just so terrific. Where did you travel from to come here? I live south of Utica, so it's about three and a half hours away. And uh, that also can be a little testy at this time of year. <laughs> oh, sure. It was winter wonderland coming through. Yeah. There you're not a... you're not unfamiliar with this part of the country. No. You went to school here. That's correct. I was in and out of here. I was here long enough, earned enough credits to graduate from here. 
I had to do it someplace. And and you let me see. You didn't show up for the yearbook, right? Picture? No. <laughs> I I avoid all those. We things. were looking we were looking for your picture of the yearbook and you weren't there. No, you won't find it. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know if that's no another camera. story entirely <laughs> or what. So what how did you happen to come here in the first place? Um do you want a serious answer? Yeah, any kind of answer. We don't care. We bounce it around. <laughs> I was interested in checking out different parts of the state that I haven't lived in before. And um, also I was interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, attending a school that was affordable for me. I was just a poor boy in central New York State. This should require some violin music, shouldn't it? There we go. <laughs> uh, I hear it now. <laughs> so you came, you spent four years here. No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> oh. I transferred here from another part of the state, another SUNY school, and then I went, um, I was here for a semester, then I went to Pisa, Italy, and Copenhagen, Denmark, on other SUNY study abroad programs. Then I came back, went to Minor Center for a semester, Oh. and then I finished um, on campus with, uh, after three and a half years, got tired of school. You've done a lot of things since then, but how did you... What was your initial introduction to Rockwell Kent? When I came up here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at that time the gift was, the original gift was recently given. It was um, 78, the autumn of 78 when I was back on campus again. Ed Brohl had just come here as uh, director for the gallery and Bruce Stark was director of special collections at that time. And between the two of them they were overseeing the collections. Um, there wasn't much of a gallery at that time. There was a basic collection and then this new gift that was still in the process of being cataloged. So Ed Brohl had asked me to catalog the pieces. So I uh, was working on the paintings, the drawings, uh, those things that are in the gallery part of the Kent collection. This uh, Rockwell Kent kind of draws you in after a while, doesn't he? He does. Um, he is, his artwork is interesting, his politics for me are just as interesting, but also I tend to favor the underdog. My brother always accused me of that, and it's true. I do favor the underdog, and Rocco was definitely an underdog. So we have, a, we have some guests here. As a matter of fact, we've got a um, show here called Generation. So let's talk a bit about it first, but let's introduce the grandson of Rockwell Kent. How, what's your first name? Oh, Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, Patrick, Patrick Finney, and uh, my mother is uh, uh, Rockwell's uh, oldest daughter, and um, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm out here for the Generation Show. Oh my show. goodness! Yeah. You expand the continent. Yes, <laughs> that's for sure. It's great to have you. Have you been here before? I've never been. Well, I've been to Plattsburgh. I've, you know, I'm, I, you know, was basically born and raised in Vermont. And uh, and moved west in 1980, and I've been out there ever since. And but I do come back here at least once a year, um, just to visit family and, you know, that kind of thing. This show is called Generations. Let's let's yeah. talk a little bit about its genesis. Well, it for me, it um, it started about a just over a year ago, maybe a year and a couple of months, and I had this thought that. Um, why not explore some of the artists in the family? I knew Ellen Pierce, she was the co-author of Forgotten Landscapes with me, and I knew that she was a practicing artist. I knew um, that Patrick was an artist from sketches that his mother had showed me years ago. Um, I knew that Thera Carter and Tim Carter were artists because of things that were in, his, uh, in their mother's house, and I knew that uh, Chris Kent was also an artist. So um, I just started asking others if they were also involved in the arts, and so we picked up a number of people that signed on to the idea. So I began the promotion part of it, just to see if I could find galleries or museums that would be interested. And um, things just kept evolving. Um, since Patrick's grandmother was the niece of Abbott Thayer, who uh, Kent had studied with briefly and is a renowned interna internationally renowned artist. Um, and since these folks, the majority of the people that were in the exhibition, 
that are in the exhibition, since they are descendants of both Rockwell and Kathleen, it made sense to include her side of the family, too, for generations. So I have a work by Abbott Thayer as well as a work by Gladys Thayer Reasoner in the show. And the um, history, the historical part of it, extends back to a great uncle of uh, Rockwell Kent by the name of Cleveland Rockwell. He worked for the U.S. Coast Survey. So there are there is a historic component to the show as well as the contemporary work. These things do have a habit of evolving. Now we, this show is a uh, as I said we're taping this and uh, just about the last week of January 2002. That's a week. How long are you going to be here? About a week. Oh no, we'll uh, just be for here long? for today. Then I will come back. Um, in February on the 14th ah. to do a program in women's studies uh, which is run by Jennifer Scanlon and um, that will focus on the sexuality that's uh, a part of Kent's work as well as his Absolutely. descendants work um, and I am open to doing other programs with other departments on campus <coughs> excuse me I feel it's important to really get the Kent collection involved in interdepartmental studies because Kent was not just an artist as Wayne oh pointed goodness. out earlier and the, the campus needs to take advantage of that. The um, administration would be a great um, spearhead to direct such activities to get these other departments involved. Um, but as I found out with working with Jennifer that it's um, very easy to do. There are a number of people that are interested in jumping on board. Uh, we just have to map it out and get things going. Yeah, I, I'm sure many of our viewers have don't know too much about the life of Rockwell Kent, and I'm sure we'll expose a lot of that information throughout the course of today. He wasn't born here in the Adirondack region. No, he's a Hudson River boy. He was born down in the Terrytown region back in 1882. He went many places and did many things. There weren't too many aspects of life that he didn't experience by design. That's true. He um, decided to live life to the fullest, as, as Patrick would know. Patrick uh, lived with Rockwell and his third wife, Sally, off and on over the years. So he got a, a taste of the wild activities of the Kent family, the homestead. Did you get to take any trips with him? Yeah. No, I never, I never did that. He was at, 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 the, at that particular point, which was late 40s and early 50s. He has uh, his, um, well, he did actually go to the Soviet Union and, uh, um, <coughs> and he did make some trips, but he basically went with Sally, uh, his third wife. And, uh, um, but uh, we, I spent a summer with him and uh, my sister and I spent uh, most of a winter with him, um, and um, it was uh, it was interesting. I mean, he was a difficult man to be around for any length of time. Uh, I won't mince words, but um, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> but certainly an interesting person to be around. And and uh, and one of the interesting uh, one of the th one of the things that I remember was the New Year's Eve parties, and he would have lots of interesting people that would come up for that particular weekend for the New Year's Eve festivities at the Kent Estate and uh, I met some fairly well-known people. One of them was uh, Paul Robeson. Wow. And uh, um, uh, and there were others. Good uh, name to start with yeah. when you're going to drop mm -hmm. names. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there were, there were others uh, which I can't recall right now but um, um, so you know there was a lot of memories uh, a lot of it uh, and, and that's about it, you know. This was a guy that, that relished, I think he relished the controversy, don't you? Oh, sure. Yeah, he yeah, he um, did that from day one. I mean, he even as a child, when he was interested in pursuing vegetarianism, and he was interested in the works of Darwin that were very popular at that time, he found himself in conflict with his own family. The, uh, his two siblings and his uh, mother and aunt would um, joke with him about being a monkey and they were uh, definitely off to the other side of the spectrum on, on that controversy. 
and um, they would just pick on him. So I think that that might have been the inspiration to for him to carry on his antics in, in later years, and he certainly did. He enjoyed playing games. He, uh, he uh, uh, you know, he was had to wait for a subpoena to be called in front of the House on Americans Activities Com Committee, and one of, uh, that was the uh, Joseph Senator Joseph McCarthy's little brainchild, but anyway, he was uh, absolutely chomping at the bit to get that subpoena because he wanted to testify. Of course. And he was furious. Every day when they'd pick up the mail, he didn't get a subpoena. He would pound his fist on the table and, and he'd say, where is my subpoena, you know? And eventually it came and he was just dancing around the house and, and was in a state of ecstasy. That's incredible. Actually, he spent how many years in the Adirondack region? Forty years or more? Well, he uh, bought property in 1927 in the house, Gladsheim, and the, the eventual farm, Adsgard, was finished in 1928. That's when they moved in. So he lived there until, lived in Osable Forks in the Jay area until 1971 when he passed away. And he was traveled far and wide. The, the stories of his... Uh, Foreign escapades are are fairly well known and oh, sure. and far away places and inhospitable places like Greenland and Alaska. But yeah, he, he loved that. Wayne was telling me how he was getting the camera as his boat was smashing against the rocks to take pictures. Yes, and I he, mean this uh, pretty well describes Rockwell Kent. Oh yeah, they, some of that footage is preserved here in special collections. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? Well, we're not going to have a chance to tell the whole story. Suffice to say, you've written a couple of books on Rockwell Kent. You've already mentioned one. This is the one you did with, uh, with Ellen called uh, Forgotten Landscapes. What's in there? Right. Well, Ellen, I should start out by saying Ellen Pierce is another grandchild. She is the daughter of Clara Pierce, um, who is a sister to Patrick's mother, uh, Kathleen. And... Um, She's represented in the Generation Show, as is Patrick. Um, the book is about the collection that was given to the Soviet Union in 1960, and the focus is on the paintings. The paintings are spread out now in Russia, Armenia, and the Ukraine, where at one time they were in just one country. But the, now, we're talking about a huge amount of stuff, um, 700 yeah. pieces? Right so. around, sure, right around 700 pieces. I did do a tally for the book, but the number escapes me. You always hear about 800 works, and they're, it's, um, it's getting up in that direction, but 700 is, is a good mark. Um, it includes paintings, drawings, prints, ephemera. Um, the largest holder of works in the, uh, in the former Soviet Union is the Pushkin. I know that Wayne had mentioned the Hermitage earlier. They are the second largest holder. Um, they in the Pushkin have the largest number of oil paintings, but the Pushkin has all of the drawings, has most of the drawings. The Hermitage only has a handful, but um, the Pushkin has hundreds of drawings. And they have uh, most of the ephemera. They have the manuscripts, the typescripts, all that type of material. So they are the, uh, the richest holder. Have you seen all these pieces? Um, I traveled with Susan Muniak, the photographer for the book, to t Russia and to Armenia. We went to t four different institutions, the Pushkin, the Armitage, the National Gallery of Armenia, and the Diligent Regional Museum. Um, we didn't get to go to the Ukraine on that trip, so that's a, a later project. That's for the revised edition. You must have been like a kid in a candy store. Oh, I was. And I, I uh, can imagine. It was, it was fun. That's wonderful. Yeah. So this, when did you do this book? That came out in 1998. Oh, it's been around a while then. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, and you did another. And what's this one about? The view from Asgard is focusing on Kent's um, life and work in the Adirondacks from 1927 till his death. Um, that was a project that I worked with with uh, the Adirondack Museum and Caroline Welsh in particular. Uh, she worked as a co-curator with me on that. Um, and we cover the gambit. 
um, a lot of the activity that he did in this area is, is captured, or the lot of most of the activity of the latter part of his life is, is captured in this little tome. This little tome, very good, Scott. <laughs> Well, besides writing books and setting up shows like Generations and learning more about Rockwell Kent, what does uh, Scott Ferris do in his spare time? Spare time. Do I, I do try to get paid. <laughs> I try to make a living. Well, what was that line that, that you mentioned before the cameras came on that Rockwell Kent said? Well, he uh, when he was being, uh, he sat down in, in front of a bank of microphones and Joe McCarthy says, all right, Mr. Kent, uh, I don't want one of your lectures. And Rockwell said, I should say not. I get paid for my lectures. <laughs> <laughs> and we were saying before that most of this stuff is somewhere in archives. We, you thought maybe CBS had all the old Kenneth. It seems to, me that, they were, it seems to me that they were the primary, um, you know, they did those news footages, the, the uh, newsreels and movies. That was a CBS. Uh, I believe, and and I and uh, of course all of the the uh, the hearings, the House Un Americans Activities Committee hearings were filmed uh, uh, because there were an awful lot of celebrities. There were actors, there were uh, academics, there were all kinds of people that were, and uh, I was, would think that that Rockwell Kent would have been uh, considered a a celebrity, uh, somebody uh, important, uh, as somebody of interest, and and so therefore it would definitely would have been caught on film, you know. So, uh, what, what were you going to say? I just I was going to pick up on the CBS part of it. Yes. Um, for your viewers, they might be interested in watching the CBS Sunday morning during April. Um, we are scheduled at the moment for a, an article on Manhegan Island artist, and Kent, of course, would be a leading figure for that article. Um, but I don't have a specific date at this time. One of those Sundays in April. That's great. It's like when this program might be aired on your local public access system. It could be one of those Sundays in April or January or February. We do try to get our listings in the local Press Republican every Friday morning for both uh, Calvin's hometown cable channel up in the Champlain area and a charter communications, which is now, I'm thankfully saying, uh, is broadcast uh, far and wide in uh, J, Upper J, Blackbrook, Blackbrook Willsboro, uh, Westport, Westport. <laughs> and points north, south, east, and west. And uh, Elizabethtown and many of our programs are broadcast in the Malone area, hopefully soon in the Saranac Lake area, because we were, this little program is done on public access as a piece of history, mm -hmm. because we think it's important to chronicle things that happen now, such as this event this weekend, so that not only can people enjoy it, learn a little more about Rockwell Kent, but 20, 30, 40 years from now, they won't be scrounging the CBS archives to find out mm, uh, some more history. The, the pants story. <laughs> they might be interested in coming to the, and seeing some of the generation's work, too. That I mean, that, that would maybe inspire them to come Maybe here. Maybe should go on the road. Uh. Well, that's already in the works, but oh, yeah. we, we have <laughs> to talk have about it. <laughs> well, that's where it started, was from um, an on-the-road sort of format, and then an opening came up here, so we grabbed it, this one first. Uh, now we just need to recircle the wagons and, and head out again. I did want to tell you one little anecdote about the title for the show. Uh, Generations was a little bit overused. You've seen shows by the, the Wyeth, the three generations of Wyeth shows and this and that. Um, but the the latter part of the title, the, title, the influence of an American master, that is uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek. And it relates to these parties at Asgard that um, Kent and his wives had over the years. His second wife, Frances, um, would sign these invitations, these elaborate invitations that I'm sure uh, there's a copy of one of them here in special collections. But um, Francis signed one of them. Francis and the Master. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that, that's, uh, is that a mouthful or what? <laughs> so that's that's part of the, the Master story. The other part is that, that Kent was a, a master of light, a painter of light. Um, and so it, it goes both both sides of the fence. 
You know, as we were, as you were talking about setting up this this show, Generations, I've often wondered how much of the bent toward artistic talent is, in in this case, for example, do you believe is is genetic, and how much is just by osmosis because you were exposed to so much of it as a youngster? What would you say to that? Well. It, p people ask me about, you know, they, they're, they're always saying, well, the talent runs in the family. When I was very young, uh, I, I didn't have a television and I didn't have much to do. I was kind of reclusive. I wasn't uh, uh, too keen on playing sports with the boys in the neighborhood and stuff. And so I spent a lot of time by myself. And I would draw basically as a way to entertain myself. And that's how I got started. I think that if I you know, if I had had a lot of distractions and television and all those kinds of things, I may not have been, uh, may not have been, uh, may not have developed my artistic uh, talents as such uh, the way I did. I think that's basically how I got started. And as I, as the ball got rolling, I became more and more interested in in art and um, and developing my talents and 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 exploring that. Uh, in that sort you of You know, thing. that's very, a very interesting story because I've heard it before. People of your generation who say, you know, I was, I was an only child or I was alone for one reason or another, so I found things to occupy my time. Some people that's began to that. whittle, <laughs> some people began to write poetry, and some people began to draw pictures. Mm -hmm. Oh, very much so. Um, the genetic part of it is one thing that I decided to stay away from because I'm not a scientist. So I t would have to have done a lot of research to prove a case one way or another. Um, but it was very obvious to me t that the greatest influence that Kent's provided, this um, legacy, which is the, uh, the Kent family artist, the group of Kent family artists, um, is that they learn through osmosis, as you say. It wasn't a traditional fathered um, mentor sort of figure like you see in the Wyeth family or even in the Abbott Henderson Thayer family um, or many other families in, in art history. But it was kind of a hands-off approach where Patrick or his cousin uh, Thayer or his cousin Tim or Natasha, some of the, the older grandchildren, they would have gotten some uh, insider comment from the master, but um, most of the participating artists really didn't know the grandfather, but they lived around his artwork and they uh, read his books. So that information, sure, it's going to, there, to come in. There is a far-reaching shadow. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't have to be related to be unfall under that shadow. Sure. But I... Other artists have already been touched upon, talking about how to, uh, Kent influenced other artists is what I mean. But um, looking at the family and seeing what his effect on them um, in an artistic sense was, uh, hasn't been approached before. And so Generations was an obvious avenue to take. I should point out that um, the Kent and Whiting families um, they come from not only visual art backgrounds, but they also had musicians and um, performers in the family, and they do today. Um, so it's a, an extension of the, the broader cultural world that uh, comes down to the great-grandchildren. Yep. I think everybody has s some creative tendencies inside, and all it takes is... Uh, you know, it's the it's the, it's, it's the desire to do it. You have to be fairly. Um, there, there's a certain drive. There's a certain uh, um, how do I put it? You know, um, kind of a, a a drive, a an inspiration, or or you know, you have to develop it. It's it's uh, you know, drawing or or being a musician or anything else requires. Um, Practice, you know, it, it, persistence, and um, and somehow some of us have that inspiration, have that, you know, have that kind of. Um, and it develops into yeah, passion. Yeah, right. It d have yeah. that passion, and uh, and that's you know that's seems to me how it, that's how it works, you know, plain and simple. Uh, there, there are so many things we could talk about in this room alone. So many things that Rockwell Kent did that seems seem to be diametrically opposed to some of his 
some of his strong views uh, and the fact that he did so much advertising oh, sure. for uh, for companies that he might have publicly decried, uh, <laughs> I find especially fascinating. Well, he had to make a living, and he would go. That's what he would say. <laughs> and he he went through um, fits with his work sometime where he would um, he knew he had to do it because he had to eat. But um, he wasn't always keen about doing the advertising work because he uh, was most interested in painting. But um, in order to paint, if you're not selling a lot of paintings, you need to do something this is, else. This is and called bread and butter, and that's, that's what right. he did for a long time. But oh. he, um, he did it in ways that um, you're starting to see, or you have been able to see other artists during this day and age. Um, do it, and that's combining high and low art, as they they call it these days. Um, but Kent and people during his time were ridiculed for that. You were either an artist or you were a commercial artist. And um, Kent said, "Damn it, I'm going to do this combination and uh, live and do what I want." He used to say, "If it's commercial, it's not art. If it's art, it's not commercial." But that's what he used to tell me. Um, but he, you know, he it was obvious to see that he violated some of his own little... Mm. Yeah, you know, <laughs> because, because uh, w when you have that many things rolling around inside your soul, you're bound to, there's bound to be some confusion. But here's a man that you, in retrospect, you have to admire for shaking his fist at convention, mm -hmm. which most of us would love to do, and we're too chicken to do it. Exactly, and we... Today, we need to do it more than ever. Um, we're just living in troubled times that we, we relive history too often. We forget the bad of the past. There was an article that I um, heard recently about how uh, times of peace are much fewer than times of war. History is made out of war, war stories, and that's very unfortunate. We. Um, I think we need to go back to the tower and, and start all over again. We're, we're look, I was glancing at your badge as you said that. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, something that was shelved years ago. It's unfortunate that it has to come back out again. If Kent were alive today, he would have a heyday with, with the politicians, with the policies of our uh, government, um, things. Would you think he's not around us chuckling right now at this conversation? <laughs> he's, he's probably chuckling at this conversation, but he's horrified by what's going on in the world around us. Yeah. Well, let us move on to the next dimension. Will we get to see some of this art in well, generations? I, I hope so. I hope so. That's one of the reasons we're here today. Let's go on with our little corner. Now let me explain what we're going to do here. Sometimes what Calvin and I do require a little explanation because we are occasionally off the wall. We learned as we were taping this show at 10 o'clock in the morning that uh, Generations, part of the gallery and show, is locked up and alarmed and we can't get in there at this point in the day. So we're going to talk about it here, we're going to look through the Generations brochure, and Calvin, with all his wit and wisdom and his handy camera, will come back at a later time, take pictures from the gallery, and superimpose them in whatever we do here, and it should work out just fine. Um, how many people are represented in this show? Oh, right around 15, 17, let's count them, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. And only one of the 16 is not a Kent family member, but his name happens to be Rockwell Kent. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> well, it's kind of tricky. Um, the Kent family, as you will find out when you do get into the show and you read the family tree, many of the people have the same name. Uh, Patrick, unfortunately, was left out, and so he's just an isolated individual, just one Patrick in the family, or at least in, um, in the greater tree. Whereas you have several Rockwell Kents, you have several Kathleen's, you have um, a couple of Ellen's, you have some Molly's, um, you have a couple of Alice's, so it's, it's a familiar sort of, sort of tree. Once you know one name, then you can figure out uh, most of these people, with the exception of 
this other Rockwell Kent, who was um, actually of the generation of Kent's father, whose name was Rockwell Kent. So you have Rockwell Kent of 1858 to 1932, who comes into correspondence with Rockwell Kent that this collection is about, and um, they discover that they're uh, people of the same name, uh, not quite the same background. This other Rockwell Kent was a proofreader for major newspapers in New York City during his day. Uh, but he also d did um, some artwork and poetry, and it's often combined. And one of the pieces in the show is called Hosea X-12, and that, um, that work um, oh my. was thought to be by one of um, Rockwell's cousins, who was also known as Rockwell Kent. Yeah, yeah we got a one right next to it. But... Um, it's it's not done by the cousin uh, Rockwell ah. Kent, who was actually Percy Rockwell Kent. Um, so as you read the brochure, you'll see that I, I made a mistake, and so we had to come up with an addendum at a later time. <laughs> so that Sounds helps like to confuse Sounds like the story of my life. But as you'll, you'll note with this piece, it's also um, signed uh, by Kent's wife, Sarah. And we have Sarah Kent in the, the Rockwell Kent family tree. And Rockwell Kent, again, who this collection is about, his um, mother's name was Sarah. You're not confused, are you? <laughs> we all have namesakes, unfortunately. All you have to do is get on the internet and look for Scott Ferris, and you'll see how many Scott M. Ferris's. There are some pretty oh, sure. famous Scott Ferris's bes besides the famous Scott R. Ferris. Oh, I haven't <laughs> met him yet either. Well, and they do many different things. <laughs> so you are unique in every respect, Scott. <laughs> how, how many pieces do you have here, uh, Pat? I think it's uh, 11 pieces, is it? Uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Probably around eight or nine pieces oh, for all Patrick. Right. All right, eight or nine pieces. I lost. Oh, is, is there a piece in the brochure yes, that we can is. look at next? Yeah, right Pick here. Pick that one, and I'll put a two right next to that one. What's it called? Well, this is a. Uh, I, I've done a lot of uh, comic book illustrations, and I've self-published them, and they were a, sort of a, of a political genre. And this particular one here is a is. A, is what's called a splash page, which is when you open up a comic book, the first page is a full illustration, the entire page. It isn't in panels. And that's what this is. And this is a picture of, uh, this is uh, uh, Newt Gingrich. And uh, this, this, that particular story is called uh, Newt's Little Indiscretion. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they all, all of those guys have things to hide, and he's no exception. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, you don't want to hope so. <laughs> You'd hope there would be some honesty out there. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Depends um, on your point of view, I guess. So, anyway, that, that's, that's, what that, that's what that particular illustration is about. Yeah. Oh, that, okay, that's great. Can we, maybe we can look at another one. Uh, is another one of no, yours? That's the, that's that's the, the only one, one in the brochure. Right. Now, how much uh, artistic leeway did you give Pat in choosing which ones to put in the exhibit? Um, basically, I just asked the participating artist to send me a bunch of slides or other type of photographic ah, materials to take a look at, and then I could develop um, the story based on that. And one of my primary concerns um, was, is there a visual reference between the contemporary artist and their grandfather or great-grandfather? And um, so that that kind of got the ball started. In Patrick's case, there is not necessarily a direct visual link. It's more the content that is the link. Patrick is kind of um, his grandfather's alter ego, Hogarth Jr., being born again, where Hogarth Jr. had a lot of license to go out there and, and say things that um, he could do so in, eight, in satire. Um, and so there is historical precedence there for Patrick as well as for Kent. I mean, Kent wasn't the first artist to use uh, drawings for political commentary. I'm fascinated by the... I'm back to the comic book idea. 
How did that happen? Well, I always liked uh, I, I always liked comic book uh, illustration or sequential art, as it's called. And when I was young, I used to buy a lot of comics, but I never read the stories. I was just uh, fascinated by the technique, the the illustrations, whether it was Superman or whether I liked the enjoyed the old horror comics of the 50s. Um, and there were some incredible artists that were doing those, and I and I just uh, that's kind of something that I gravitated towards, you know, that I, you, you know. You know, for some reason, not that I'm an artist by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm also interested in the artwork in comics and cartoons. You know, Prince Valiant comes to mind. Well, that was, uh, that was, I'm um, trying to think of his name, that was uh, uh, Foster, what was his name? Um, uh... I don't remember don't his name. Me. I don't know the names yeah, of most of my relatives. Yeah, that was Hal Foster, I believe his first name was. Hal Foster, who was, um, did the original Prince Valiant, who's one of the most incredible artists oh, you'll oh. ever want to see. Just absolutely amazing. After he died or, or quit drawing that particular comic strip, others took his place to continue the Prince Valiant uh, um, you know, comic book and storyline and so on and so forth, but none of them measured up to Hal Foster. He was absolutely a master, and you could tell this guy he was was as fine an artist as is is as, as it's possible to be. You, if you know, you it's nice to share those yeah, those feelings because yeah, I hadn't thought of that right, for a long, long time. Right. So it, all you have to do is to if to go back, uh, find a book. Uh, and, and there are a lot of them. There's a lot of books published of um, of the older, you know, works and uh, uh, of comics and sequential artists. And if you l study his work and look at it, uh, not just read the story, but just study his work, his 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 detail um, is just extraordinary. And and uh, and that's and he was one of my uh, inspirations for sure, along with other people that came later like uh, 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 the two uh, Frank Giacoa uh, who did um, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes and then Frank Frazetta who's an extraordinary uh, uh, sequential artist um, and and of course Wally Wood and uh, Neil Adams and of course uh, Jack Kirby and people like that were just absolutely amazing artists Eventually, they uh, they started in the in the in the early 80s. They became recognized by the art world as being fine artists, as opposed to sort of relegated to the sort of the you know the garbage heap of art. I mean, no one gave them the time of day. It was they weren't considered real artists, even though they could really draw. And people who were really artists, the abstract artists, who couldn't draw. That's never been explained to me, but anyway. <laughs> uh, this, and so now a lot of those uh, artists are coming into their own. They're, they're getting recognized and they're getting, they're getting the, the, the uh, recognition that they deserve, I think. That but is they, very interesting that we should get on this topic because it happens to be a favorite of Calvin's and of mine. We've always been interested in comic books. And I read today's newspaper comics mm. on a regular basis, and the subject matter is getting, you know, ri more risque and heavier in many ways to reflect the times. Mm. But they're certainly not designed. Today's comics are not designed necessarily for children. No, that's true. And and uh, well, I mean, there's, there's still a lot of children's comics that are that are that are out there. Uh, but but uh, uh, there, uh, the comic book business generally is not what it was. It really peaked in the middle 80s and it's just it's been downhill ever since and um, that's why I've kind of abandoned the uh, you know th that particular uh, genre I'm moving on to something else uh, because I'm not I've never cared much for superheroes it's that's kind of boring it's Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and you know guys with bigger muscles and more guns and so on and so forth it's just pretty dull and uh, oh Shazam uh, yeah <laughs> and so I, I was doing I was doing you know uh, mine were uh, pretty much uh, uh, political satire I guess and and uh, it's a tough business when you're 
writing the story, you're doing all the illustration and trying to sell them at the same time, it's, it's virtually impossible. And uh, it's labor intensive doing a comic book because you know, there's so much artwork to do. And if you're going to come out with a, a comic book every so many months, you're working all the time on it to try to get the next issue out because you want to keep that. If there is some interest out there, you have to keep that interest up by coming out with the next issue and the next issue and the e next issue. And Se sequential art. You know, I never thought of it that yeah. way. It's almost like doing uh, doing animated cartoons. Well, it's storyboarding and and, and that guy. There's different. You know, that's a that's a term used in 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 animation. But this is called. Uh, you know, the, the technical term is uh, sequential, sequential art. Sequential art. Yeah. I learned something today. Right. <laughs> well, we digressed for a moment, and I didn't mind a bit. Let's talk about some of the other things in here. Wherever you want to. Wherever you want to go, mention a piece and we'll talk about it. I wanted to bring up a point that um, Patrick kind of touched upon um, unintentionally, and that is um, one of the other qualifications, if I had qualifications for artists for this show, is artists in the family that are active, that are currently practicing, that have been practicing for a while, that are making it at least a semi-profession, if not a full profession. And um, that's what most of these participants do. Um, they do other things, too. Ellen Pierce writes. Um, Chris Kent is a landscape architect. Uh, Clara Dennison um, teaches art. Uh, Tim Carter works in photography. He's, um, does architectural photography. Um, Thera Carter works as the head fabricator for a museum in New Mexico. So, oh, and, and Molly Carter, his daughter, works um, at the Terra Museum in Chicago, but she is, um, she does more artwork um, than probably work time at the museum. So you have this, um, this body of, of active people. What, what you've proved and what I've known for a long time and perhaps our audience may not be aware of or thought about is when you are creative, it's, it's like carrying around a bag of dynamite. It's liable to go in any direction at any given time. And sometimes it's the way you feel today, whether you want to write or draw or sculpt. Yeah, well, that's that's um, that, the, the reason I am not a commercial artist is because I want that freedom to be able to uh, go wherever it takes me, you know, whatever that that source of inspiration comes from or wherever it is, it, it sort of leads you around by the nose, uh, you know, and, <laughs> I and, love it. and, and, and I want to be able to do that and express it. And that's where I get the satisfaction of, as opposed to somebody saying, well, I want you to design a logo for me, or I want you to design a, you know, a, a, a you know, a, something on a, any, on a junk food box or something like that. I mean, that, that just isn't something that I care about doing. There are people who do that and they do it very well. Uh, I don't happen to be one of them. Uh, I, I enjoy the, the, the freedom to be able to sit down at my drawing board and to create whatever comes into my head. And that's, yeah, you don't yeah. like to be shoved into a box forever and ever, like Pete Seeger's Little Boxes song from way back when. Oh. Yeah. You, well, he wasn't shoved into a box either. No, not at all. <laughs> not even close. Okay, what, what do you want to talk about next? Oh, boy. Um, let's just go back to the historical aspect just for a moment. And um, I had mentioned earlier about how Patrick and Tim, Thayer, Natasha did have some contact with Kent um, for comment about their work, uh, you know, even if they were working as, uh, as young folk. Um, they they still receive something from him directly related to art, um, but I think the person that received more o over the shoulder sort of comments uh, was his eldest son, who's also called Rockwell. It's very easy to keep this story straight. Everyone's name Rockwell, so we'll move on to <laughs> Rockwell Kent. So I guess we'll number this three. Okay, three right here. Gotcha. Um, and. His son went with him to Alaska in 1918, 1919. He was eight, turning nine during that trip. And um, Picture yourself that age, going off on a trip like that at that point in history. Oh, sure. And, what they, and the adventures that they had. And as Patrick said earlier, picture going with your uh, father, in this case, for that length of time. 
That I must have been um, you know, dramatic build, in itself. Build a cabin and hang around there f for the whole winter, right? Sure. So what do you do? You write and you draw. And there are a couple examples of Rocky's work, as the son was called, um, in the exhibition. And then the other person who also was, was pretty close to t the father um, in an artistic sense was Barbara, uh, one of the daughters, the, uh, the youngest of the three daughters. She was born in 1915. There are two pieces um, that show her um, early sketches. Um, and they do show hints of her father's work. Um, some of the loose, uh, rapid brush strokes, uh, highly stylized forms. Um, and so you could call this piece here uh, number four. Um, but there are two works by her in the, uh, in the gallery exhibition. Um, Kent's sister was a, another person who is uh, represented in the show. There are a few works by her. There's a lithograph, there's this watercolor, there is an oil, um, and she lived in New Mexico most of her life. Um, a lot of her work is similar to her brother's in the sense that uh, she's working with reduced forms. She's taking the complexities of nature and reduce, reducing them to simple modeled forms. Um, and you see that in the work in the exhibition. So these are people that had direct contact with, uh, with Kent, uh, primarily the children again, but um, his sister certainly was aware of what was going on with his work and, and vice versa. Um, you get into work by t Tim and Thayer, which is illustrated here. This piece by Tim called Ice Light. Okay, it's a photograph six. that's in the show. And this piece, Sunspots North Atlantic, seven. Uh, by Thayer. They um, are two works in the show that are very close to Kent's own work. You'll see uh, a painting of Kent's called Sledging that looks uh, very similar to Ice Light. Um, and then you have uh, a couple of works that Thayer would have seen innumer innumerable times as a child. One was uh, a Kent illustration for Moby Dick. Another one was an illustration for a book that Kent wrote and illustrated called Voyaging. And um, the compositions have uh, many similarities. You know, we're, we're all a product of everything we've ever seen and felt and smelled and heard and so it's it would be almost impossible or like although we like to think we do unique work not to have some influence of something we've seen before sure and when you paint. Kent said he abhorred influence he said it was like a vacuum but um, it's a way to avoid it is it I mean it's just it's inevitable right yeah. mm. and he was like everyone else um, he read a lot, he experienced a lot, and it shows up in his work. That's who you are, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's great. Okay, next. <laughs> well, since we're open to this page, um, well, yeah, let's, let's okay. go with Chris Kent, sure. Okay. Um, Chris, <coughs> excuse me, is um, a California resident now, but he's done a lot of traveling over the years, and this is in the, one of the pieces in the show is of Manana Island a tiny little island off in the distance in his composition here, um, as painted from the uh, the Horns Hill area on Monhegan Island, off the coast of Maine. And um, that, uh, the composition again is, is very similar to Kent's work, and that's why I pull that into the show. Um, just to make use of this open space here with the brochure and to fall back on a couple of historic artists. Um, this piece by Alice Kent Stoddard Pearson, <coughs> excuse me, she married later in life, uh, but uh, so she's primarily known as Alice Kent Stoddard, uh, which is very unique because as you could guess, his, uh, her mother was named Alice Kent Stoddard. Not to confuse you here, but she was uh, 
a renowned artist in her own right during her own time. She, like Kent, painted on Menhegan. She went back there much more frequently than he did. Um, but she was also renowned as a portraitist, um, painting a lot of important people on the federal and state level, city level, in the Philadelphia area that she lived in. She, did, she lived here at some point? No, she didn't no. live up here. She lived around the Philadelphia area. The and name Stoddard was, is synonymous with photography in the Adirondacks. Oh, sure. As I'm sure our viewers know. Sure. Okay. Um, I don't know if there is a family tie there. I didn't need to branch <laughs> off we try on everything. another tree. <laughs> okay. The tree I was working on, the branches were already so heavy yeah. that people were falling off. The, um, the oldest artist uh, represented in the show is Cleveland Rockwell. Okay. And it's that family where the name Rockwell really gets started. It was a, uh, the name of uh, Kent's grandmother, Matilda Rockwell, and her brother was Cleveland Rockwell. Well, he was around in the early stages, the early uh, uh, period of American history, where he was surveying the coast um, by commission of the federal government, and he spent most of his time on the west coast, the area that Chris and Patrick live in now, um, and he was just literally surveying the, the coast, painting it, drawing it um, for the federal record. Um, one piece that I was very, two pieces that I was delighted to bring into the show um, are works from Kathleen's side of the family. Kathleen Whiting, as I say, um, stems from the, the Thayer family. Her uncle was Abbott Thayer, and he, Abbott Thayer was also a teacher of um, Kent and of uh, an aunt of Kent, who is also represented in the show, Josephine Holgate. Um, but there's a, a fine, large portrait of Abbott by his daughter, Gladys. So the, the generations continue on that side. Um, but Abbott also painted his own sister, Susan Thayer, who um, became Susan Thayer Whiting, Kathleen's mother. And it's, it's fun to have this painting here and for the opening of the exhibition to have all of these granddaughters and a great-granddaughter, or a couple of great-granddaughters will be here. I must say, when I first opened this brochure a few weeks ago, that's the painting that draw, drew my eye. There's something haunting about that, that figure. I, I really mm. like that. Well, to see it in person is, is so much nicer because you see the, the detail of the paint, the texture, the brush strokes, um, and the figure is so much livelier, and I'm waiting to uh, see the granddaughters pass and just to make a comparison between Ooh. their great-grandmother and uh, their great-great-grandmother uh, just to see how the physical traits carried on. That's terrific. Now, do we have any? Yeah, we got more. Oh, we've got lots of. We artwork. got more. Sure. Um, how many pieces are in the exhibit altogether? Around sixty-six, I think, was the final count. I've read sixty-one in the uh, the notices, <laughs> but I think we ended up closer to sixty-six. No. Have you seen the whole thing? No, I haven't. Have, oh, no, you I haven't. haven't. No. This is going to be a new thing oh, yeah. for you today. Yeah. I just blew into town last night, so, yeah, and so this is going to be, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll be a lot better once you get some really good breakfast, right? I guarantee you that. <laughs> we'll be back to talk more about this wonderful exhibit in just a moment. We're, we're talking about a very erudite subject of uh, starving to death here in all of our st stomachs rolling and rumbling in unison. <laughs> Patrick, I want to thank you so much for coming here, for being a part of this, because you are, whether you like it or not. Well, thank you very much, and I enjoyed this interview. It's been, it's been great. It was very, last night, uh, Scott and I got together uh, under uh, um, peculiar circumstances, but we had a great time, and, and he suggested I come down here and, and, and be part of this interview, and I really appreciate it, Scott. Uh, we're, I'm yeah. personally pleased, and I know Calvin is, yeah. and I know our viewers are, because it's a wonderful story, and this is one way to tell it. Okay, Have yourself a wonderful day and a good trip back to Portland. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll see you. I haven't right. been to Portland in a couple of years, anyway. 
Uh, you're welcome to make your make your exit in any way that you find appropriate. Scott, uh, I also want to thank you for what you're doing here. You said you are pleased with the way this came together. How can oh, you yeah. help it? Well, it, it's rough. Putting a show together is always rough, especially when you're dealing with people from around the country, um, literally from Massachusetts to California and Oregon, New Mexico, Missouri, Chicago. Um, it's just, it's tar it's difficult logistically. But also, I'm not in Plattsburgh. I don't live here, and so I need to work with the people up here like David Driver, Mary Lou, uh, Boharnois, um, Cecilia Esposito, Ed Broll, of course, um, Marge, um, the I feel student. like you just won an, an Oscar, and I like <laughs> to thank my mother. <laughs> well, that's, that that's it. You're, you're a team. Yeah. You have to work together or it's, um, it doesn't come together. Well, uh, you know, it's nice to have this much class at a local campus. We've been great fans of uh, this campus for a long, long time because it's a big part of what the North Country is. And to have produced somebody like Scott Ferris oh, well, and uh, see you. what you've accomplished in your life, it's got to be pretty satisfying. You're still a young guy. What's on the horizon for you? Uh, retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like a young man to think that way? <laughs> uh, what's on the horizon? More Kent projects. Kent, even though you say you've, you've been on campus a number of times, Kent is here. Kent is still ever-present. But he is, he is not out in the forefront like he needs to be. People really need to appreciate what is here. And it's not just a, a local need to see and experience and appreciate and understand. It's an international uh, phenomenon that has to uh, break through again. Kent did it himself, but now he's gone. He can't promote himself anymore aside from what is, what is here, what is uh, making up this collection and the rest of the collection, the, the paintings and such. Um, so that's what I do. I promote his work in whatever way I can. Um, Plattsburgh has received another extremely large batch of um, artwork, uh, papers um, that are right now on campus that are owned by Plattsburgh State and they're slowly going through cataloging. Um, there's a great need to get all that stuff cataloged now and to uh, get it in its repositories here in special collections over there in the gallery in both places There needs to be an infrastructure developed so that the collection can be used to uh, the greatest um, purpose um, So there's a lot of work that needs to be done here, and if I can facilitate that through projects like this then um, Then that's a benefit a lot of the pieces that your viewers will see in this show are from that new gift, uh, pieces that Cecilia Esposito has dug out of uh, the boxes. Um, She's an amazing lady. And I, um, I've told her about things that I remember that were at, at the estate when I kind of uh, boxed a lot of that stuff up before I left in 1982. Um, and she's been able to dig it up. She's found new materials. And um, she and Wayne Miller and Ed Brohl, um, everybody needs to start working together to get everything in its rightful place and get it out there, get it exposed. But you, you have this tremendous sense of history, and I hope that we have too. And I hope that this very show will be a part of perpetuating who Rockwell Kent was. Oh, we I try know. to do this with citizens large and small. Rockwell Kent was a... A towering figure. was a towering figure in many sure. in so many ways and whether you agreed with his politics now or or 60 years ago or 70 years ago you can't deny his existence exactly and he's knocking at the door <laughs> and he's he around every corner yeah he was a towering man but he was also the common man and he was there for the common man to um, bring them up to their their greatest capabilities to help them along um, and people forget that. He was a gadfly in many ways. And oh, yeah. He, he, as, we've, as, as I hope I have made clear during this interview, he loved it. He loved to get people thinking about things. Oh, sure. And um, he did it through his artwork. He did it through his talks. He did it through uh, common talk. 
and or I shouldn't say common talk. That often has evil commentations, and that's not <laughs> that's not what I meant. Not at all. Um, and this, he's still speaking to us through this legacy, his artistic grandchildren and great grandchildren, um, and that's what people will see in this show is that he still is an active voice, but there has to be a human form that puts that into action. So you have this tremendous collection here, but you need to have people like Wayne and Ed and Cecilia uh, pushing it out there. Or um, if they are tied down for whatever reason, then they need um, some feisty young sport from down the road to come up here and, and help push it out a bit more. Well, you're pretty feisty, and you're still pretty young <laughs> compared to me, so uh, <laughs> that's your mission. Uh, Scott, thanks again so much for all of this and for everything else you do, oh, and best of good fortune in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on your show. It was fun. <laughs> well, now we've, uh, we've let the other folks go and get some breakfast and get prepared for what will be a fine exhibit that begins this afternoon as we're recording this still on a Saturday morning, although that morning is waning. It's 11.15 a.m. I don't even know the date today. It's late in January. It's the 26th. 26th, all right. And uh, we're back to the guy who runs the show in here. And I, when they say special collections, Wayne Miller, uh, they're not kidding because these collections you have here are very special. And this is a prime example. There is probably not another collection like this like this one anywhere on the face of the earth. Well, no, there are collections that have more manuscript materials than we do, but I don't believe for the breadth of, so of uh, uh, what we have for Kent materials, this is probably the largest collection. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, walking in this room, people would say, oh, that's where they keep the old stuff. Uh, no idea, but when you start taking things off the shelves, well, I, mean, I, I got to ask you a question just to interrupt a moment. Don't you feel like, as I, I said to Scott, a, a, a kid in a, a, you know, a kid in a candy shop when you come in here and open new stuff that comes in, look at these letters and look at this book and you say, wow. Oh, I do. And, and uh, I, I love my work. Um, it's, it's fascinating, and the, the breadth of materials that we have. I mean, the Kent collection in itself could keep a person interested and occupied for years. Uh, and as we've discussed in previous shows, we have uh, lots of other things in special collections, photographs and maps, and uh, things from three centuries of the history of the region, and material beside history, as, as Kent is uh, uh, so clearly illustrates here, you know, one of the uh, great artists of uh, 20th century America um, and we have a research level collection uh, here tucked away in, in uh, uh, the bowels of Feinberg Library. And you know I just want to make sure that our viewers far and wide for now and forever know that this this special Rockwell Kent collection is here in this room separate and distinct from the Rockwell Kent Gallery which is a different kind of uh, presentation entirely. Right, they have the art you would hang on the wall in essence and we have the art that you would put on a shelf. Um, we have books and uh, journals and some manuscript. Uh, uh, we're going to be looking at some of the various forms that uh, uh, Mr. Kent's art uh, took um, and we, we have uh, all of those things that uh, would um, help someone doing uh, background research on, on Kent. Uh, the gallery has the spectacular public kinds of, of materials, the paintings on the wall, uh, and, and they, you know, it's a lovely facility for anybody who has uh, not been to the Kent Gallery. Uh, it's well, well worth the time, even when there's not a special show, but they often mount wonderful shows of various aspects of his art. We don't plan to show you everything in this room today. We could go back and do another chapter. We've done several chapters with Wayne and various aspects of his life and loves. But uh, we do want to whet your appetite. And so we've uh, 
pulled a few things from the shelves here, and let's discuss them in any order you choose, Mr. Miller. Well, first, I'd just like to just kind of describe what is in the collection. Yes. And uh, we have materials that were written by Kent. He was a wonderful author. Uh, we have uh, books that were illustrated by Mr. Kent. Wow. Uh, we have books that it contain his artwork. Uh, we have books that were written about his artwork. Uh, and we have uh, a, a lot of material that its only connection to him was that it was part of his personal library. The core of this collection, the vast majority of this collection, was in fact uh, taken from the bookshelves of Mr. Kent. And we have another uh, group of materials that are that are heading toward here. Scott referred to them that they're they're in process, uh, and it's a, a significant amount of material we're going to have to figure out a different way to uh, to shelve our, our Kent collection because it's going to be growing significantly here in the next uh, year or two. Uh, and so we have arranged this collection. Librarians always have to arrange things on shelves. Oh, yeah. uh, and I didn't do the arranging. This was uh, done about 20 years ago. Um, and it is arranged depending on uh, its relationship to Mr. Kent. So all of the books uh, written by him are in one section and all those written about him are in a different section. Uh, to help us locate those materials uh, and for anyone who wants to research what, what we own uh, or what exists uh, uh, that relates to Mr. Kent, uh, if you have internet access you can come to uh, uh, plattsburgh.edu and get into the uh, um, library catalog, this is a general library catalog, uh, and search for Rockwell Kent as an author or as an illustrator or as a subject and you will find Kent materials. There's also some Kent bibliography that's uh, on the library website that was prepared uh, last year in re re uh, relation to uh, the Rockwell Kent Symposium that was held here and at the Adirondack Museum and, and at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge. Um, and beyond that, we are uh, we have our own in-house catalog, which we are in the process of converting to uh, electronic form, and hope to have that uh, mounted on on the web sometime soon. <laughs> That's no small project all by itself. And this is this is uh, just what what we use in-house and. Uh, in archive languages, it's just called a calendar. It's, it's strictly a a shelf list uh, of of everything that is um, in our collection here, with some some description and the shelf number, so that we can uh, pull materials on demand. Um, and what what is listed in there uh, is uh, um, all of the books and all the other formats materials we have. And and I pulled a few uh, things off. Uh, the shelves. Uh, we want to see them. We want to okay. see all of them. Well, one, what, this may be a good thing to start with. Rockwell Kent in the 1930s was um, one of the premier uh, advertising artists. Uh, obviously, uh, for someone with the political and social views that he had, this was not his first love, but it paid the bills, and it gave him the freedom to uh, um, follow his art and follow his uh, uh, desire to visit the Arctic climates and uh, be involved with uh, uh, political movements and, and whatnot. And so this is an example. This is uh, an illustration that was done for the American Express Travel Service. Is that a lithograph? What is, I mean, is it a... This, this is, is a actually a page right out of the magazine. Okay. Okay, this this one isn't titled at the bottom, but we've got the same illustration here. It's a woodcut, that's what I meant to say. Well, yeah. From uh, a woodcut, it says, anyway. Yes. Uh, he he did these, uh, he turned out an incredible number of these. We have this uh, uh, book we have here. He obviously... Um, because there are copyright and royalty uh, issues involved in art for hire, uh, he kept a, uh, and as uh, any commercial artist would, a book of those illustrations that he had published. And so that's what we have here. It's essentially a scrapbook with all of these uh, pages from the magazines tipped in. Um, and you can you can see. I mean, this is a, this is a great theme here. Uh, first of all, you can see the. Uh, his use uh, is, is just black and white, but the 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 power 
um, the, the definition that he gets into that line drawing uh, or that woodcut is, is amazing. And of course the subject matter with, with the workmen, uh, you know, with the, with the proud uh, uh, air about it, one can see why the Soviet Union that, that celebrated uh, the proletariat, even if the, it didn't work, work out uh, the public relations aspect of, of celebrating <laughs> yeah. the proletariat, um, was very important, and you can see why Kent's um, style was very alluring to them. Um, which is not to say it's necessarily communist, it's, it's rather universal, and it is, it is celebrating the workman. Uh, but you can see the, the gears, the modern times. I mean, it's almost could be right out of Charlie That's Chaplin. That's what I was just going to say, yeah. And it's just about that period. Uh, I don't see the date on this one, but uh, th that's the period we're talking about. This is through the 20s and into the 30s that he was doing all of this illustration. Looks like 1934, and it would have been in uh, Fortune, the famous Fortune magazine. Huh? Well, that's it. He did it for leading magazines. He did it for uh, Sherwin-William Paints. Here's, here's a, a Sherwin-William Paint one. Uh, he did a, a whole series for them color. Uh, in color. Yeah, this is fairly unusual because it's a color one. Um, he also did, uh, well, I don't think the color part was his. I think it's the uh, statues on either side, oh. uh, but I wouldn't swear to it. Um, he did a, a whole series for a jeweler in New York City, Marcus. Um, he, did, uh, he did some just for stories, but... Uh, uh, what's this? Great American Group. I believe that's an insurance company. There's a a bit more detailed one. Actually, that's not. I got the wrong side here. Is here's the Kent. Actually, here this is a painting going from a story on the Saturday Evening Post. Saturday Evening Post. So there's, there, there was a show done by the gallery, I believe, two years ago on the advertising art of Rockwell Kent, oh, yeah. and that was a, a well-attended and well-received show. Um, we also have um, some manuscript, not a lot. This is an area we're, we're working on, uh, on developing, and there's a significant amount of manuscript in that uh, uh, remainder of the estate, the rest of the gift that's coming our direction. Uh, but we also get gifts of, of Kent materials from people who knew uh, uh, Mr. Kent had associations with him. Some of the books here were donated by a gentleman named Dan Byrne Jones, who was a, an art dealer and um, expert. And um, and uh, uh, we recently were gifted, with the help of, of Scott, uh, with a, a collection of letters. That's a great story. Um, there was a, a gentleman by, uh, by the name of uh, Donald Madison, who was the director of a, an art institute in Indianapolis. And Mr. Kent, uh, as, as was alluded to by his uh, grandson uh, and the uh, comment about his testimony before the McCarthy Committee, um, did make uh, uh, a good part of his living doing lecture tours. And he, for a number of years, would make a summer tour, uh, giving oh, uh, maybe six or 12 uh, lectures uh, across North America. Well, uh, in the mid-1930s, um, uh, one year he uh, toured uh, Toronto and Chicago and uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and Indianapolis, Indiana, where he met the wife of uh, Donald Madison, a woman by the name of Catherine Madison. And the two of them obviously struck it off. And uh, a correspondence followed. Well, uh, Mrs. Madison's daughter, who lives down in Cape Cod, um, attended a, a lecture given by Scott Ferris uh, a few years ago and engaged him in conversation afterward. And Scott, of course, realized the importance of um, what, what we're about to look at here. And this is a, a series of, of uh, letters, uh, almost 20 of them, uh, that were written by Rockwell Kent to Mrs. Madison over a period of several years through the rest of the 1930s. Uh, and they're, they're very familiar. Uh, um, uh, he obviously thought a great deal of her. Um, there's no evidence that they had anything other than a platonic relationship, but when you read the text of the letters, 
that boggles the mind. Um, some of the letters were written from uh, Greenland uh, while he was uh, isolated there. Uh, this one particular one here that I'd like to share with you. First of all, just notice the handwriting. His handwriting is so amazing. But I don't know if you can catch that on the on the top there, where you would normally have the date and place. Yeah. He wrote. Can you read that, Gordy? Uh, October. I don't know what, where. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> he he was having an adventure and uh, tiny writing and and so precise. Oh, absolutely! Large spaces between the words. Isn't that amazing? So this was a a wonderful gift, uh, uh, and uh, we were very very happy to receive it. Uh, um, and uh, I'd like to publicly thank Scott for his his role in it. And and uh, that's how you make history. I mean, these letters. Most of these letters are uh, well, they, are older than I am. They they are valuable um, uh, for any scholar who wants to uh, get a feel for what the man was like. Uh, you know, that's that's always the the, the trick as we. Uh, study biography uh, and uh, for for the biography channel or the history channel or somewhere where they've got all of this footage of the people they do uh, that's wonderful you can see their mannerisms and we do have some film uh, of Mr. Kent uh, so we can get some of that but to get a sense of who uh, this person was we, we know all he was multifaceted that he was uh, that he uh, was uh, uh, uncompromising that he was uh, uh, difficult to get along with at times, uh, that he was not the most likable or liked uh, person in the world. But, uh, you know, all of us, uh, any any public figure we, we have a, has a persona and uh, there's a private person behind that. And it's through letters like this that we can start to get some sense of who that private person was. Uh, as well as informing us about well, I mean, here he is. He's traveling. He's you know he's in Greenland, or he's, he's he doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know what day it is. He's on a train. He's on a lecture tour. You know, it's like that uh, old '60s movie. It's this is Tuesday. It must be Belgium. Yeah. Uh, I th you know, there's a bit of sense of that that. This was not his love, but he had to pay the bills. He had a wife and family. He had uh, responsibilities. Uh, so, uh, and part of of uh, developing himself as an artist was making his work known, and the the lecture tours helped promote his art as well as pay some bills. Uh, you know, the advertising art uh, allowed him to hone his skills while at the same time paying paying some bills, even if it he didn't have the freedom to. Um, draw just whatever and whenever he felt like it. Uh, it's, it's still an important part of who he was and how he developed. Um, another part of his art that um, it was very important, uh, he was one of the uh, premier book illustrators and not just drawing illustrations for the books, and we'll look at some of those in a minute, uh, but he also uh, designed and created a great number of book plates. Now, book plates are something that are pretty much a thing of the past, but the, this is one of three books uh, that contain illustrations of his, of his book plates. This happens to be later book plates. Um, and book plates, for those who don't know, would be, this is a book plate inside the front of the book, from the library of. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, Libris. Yeah, so whether it's a, a library, a uh, college or a public uh, library that would put this in, um, or uh, more was the case with individuals, uh, sure. uh, collectors and people who just had their personal libraries and would lend books around to each other and this would give them well, some would, chance. I would to guess there's a whole <laughs> generation of readers out there who don't know about book plates. Well, my father's extensive mm -hmm. book collection and this was wonderful for him to have his personal book plate oh, in exactly. every book that he owned. It was it was a, a very common uh, thing up until uh, it's just been in the past 20 or 30 yeah. years that they really uh, stopped uh, 
uh, being something that you would find on a regular yeah. basis. Well, it, as we get fewer and fewer people who are who are collecting hardcover books, I mean, we're talking, you know, uh, the cost of books these days, and uh, you know, the the variety of forms of of uh, educational materials or recreational materials, entertainment uh, has exploded. Uh, that we we don't have that many people buying hardcover books. Uh, as a percentage of of the total entertainment and educational market, it's it's uh, shrunk. Um, and you know, if you buy a paperback book, but it, you know, it's what they call miracle binding. And in the library trade, we say we use the line, "It's a miracle if it holds together while it's read three times." <laughs> sure, yeah. And that's that's about what it's rated yeah. for. is about three reads, uh, or some of them are less than that. So, but you're going to spend money on a book plate for something that's going to fall apart. Yeah. You know, so. It's, it's read them and throw them away as opposed to books that you collect. We're going to be looking at, at some books here that are, are from the era when books were collected and were, are something that you would want to collect. The, just the exclusive of what's in the book, the book itself as an artifact, is important, it's, is, is beautiful. So that's a book of book plates. Now, um, I know it's been mentioned before that, uh, that Rockwell went to Greenland. He actually went there twice, I believe. Uh, and um, this is this is a book that he wrote uh, about that experience in Greenland, and you can see this is a mass market book, and and because we're talking about something that's 70 years old, I don't know if the camera picks that up, but you can see around the edges that it's starting to yellow because this is um, you know p cheaper quality paper, uh, and we'll look at some other books here in a minute that are the same age that look like they were printed yesterday. Well, no, they don't because you don't get that quality anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Uh, but this is, this is uh, he was popular as a mass market art, um, author as well as, a, uh, you know, one for the specialty market. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you uh, a Moby Dick uh, in a fine edition. But I just wanted to show you that he was not just an American author, that he was reprinted in many languages. Uh, and I'm not a, a, a Slavic linguist, um, but this is an Eastern European language, uh, and I'm not sure which one. I have to look it up uh, uh, to double check. But you can clearly see that this is Moby Dick, uh, and this is a, a great Kent illustration. On, on the back is sort of the theme on, on the paper jacket is the, the theme for the Rockwell Kent that he kind of used uh, over and over again. You'll see repeated, uh, we even have some wrapping paper that incorporates this theme that he designed and had printed to uh, wrap up gift books of Moby Dick uh, that he gave his presents. Um, next I'd like to show you um, the variety of editions that things can go through the same book. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, North by East, and this is one edition of it. Uh, this would have one, one value, this is a monetary value and scholarly value. Uh, next we have a slightly different edition that still has the paper jacket on it, for those of you who are, are collecting books or going to garage sales or things. Um, you'll know that uh, if you have it with the dust jacket on it, it's that much more valuable. Uh, here's a reprint from uh, 1996. So he is still being read. Um, he's still provocative and current enough uh, that uh, his books are worthy of reading and, and uh, do sell enough to warrant being reprinted. And here is another, a foreign edition. Of, of that same work. And this is in uh, the Cyrillic alphabet, so um, if it's not Russian, it's, it's, it's a related language. Uh, so there, and we have several more editions. Those are just four different editions. For uh, a collection such as ours, we attempt to collect all of the various editions because there may just be a small difference from one to the next. Um, but that can be important. And just the mere fact that he is still being published and republished is important. To, to uh, document that by having those editions is, is something we try to do. 
Now we're gonna move on. I'm gonna put my glasses on for this because I I enjoy these too much to uh, to not be able to appreciate them with you. We're we're into the uh, the element of spectacular here. Right. Well, this okay. In the 1930s, as his reputation as a book illustrator uh, grew to gigantic proportions, and he became the preeminent book illustrator uh, in the United States, he was approached by fine presses. Now, there are, you know, if you and I go to uh, the drugstore or the supermarket and go to the paperback book rack, you know, there'll be pocket books, a division of, uh, uh, you know, one of the large publishing houses, which have been, uh, as with other industries, they've been merging and merging, and we're, we're you know, we have a few giants uh, of the publishing industry. But there are, have always been, and there continue to be, um, <coughs> excuse me, a small number of what are called fine presses. And one of the finest, uh, it was uh, in the 1930s, was called the Lakeside Press. And Rockwell was uh, um, approached through his agent uh, to illustrate reissues of the classics, of some classic books, uh, by the Lakeside Press. Now, uh, this is a, a, uh, a Kent illustrated edition of uh, the Lakeside Press Moby Dick. Uh, as you can see, it's in three volumes. It's and and Gordy and, and Calvin saw me unpack it from the cardboard packing case, and it's not just a single cardboard box. It's a cardboard box within a cardboard box, with with spacers uh, to uh, keep it from shucking around. Then it's inside an aluminum slip case, and then you have the books themselves. You can see it's form fit. Oh my! Then you have the uh, the plastic. And remember, this is the 1930s, so I mean, you, you didn't have the variety of plastics uh, and the cost. It was an exotic item. Oh, of course. So you have this plastic, and again here you have this theme uh, that of of the Moby Dick and that abstract theme, which is wonderful. And as you open it up now, this edition, when, when you have fine uh, books, fine, fine publishing or, or older uh, books, they were, uh, today the way a book is published is they uh, chop up a bunch of, uh, a big sheet of paper into a lot of pages and they print them one or the other, then they take them, they hold them all together and they slap some glue on the back, wrap a, a, a piece of cardboard around it and that's a book. No, that's not a book, I'm sorry. When we're talking about fine binding and publishing, you take a very large piece of paper, as big as this table. You print 16 or 32 pages or 64 pages on that single sheet of paper. The paper is then folded in a certain way, and those folios are, are sewn together. And the whole thing is then bound. End papers are are incorporated, sewn to the to the body of the book, and the end papers are then attached to the boards that are the book cover. And so, when you get a fine book, you know, and you and when you first buy it, it is uncut. The pages in the book are uncut. You will notice that most of the pages in this book are uncut. Here is a page. You see that? There's the page. The page has not been cut. If, if this were to go on the market, this would add to the value. It's like an unused, oh, you know, sure. it's like a mint coin that the, the pages are uncut. Now let's find an illustration here just to, well, here's just a, a, little, a little doodad. Uh, is that the captain? Sure is. Looks like it looks like uh, they have himself. They have himself. Um, and there's a looks like on the on the docks. Are there some of the, the supplies, the barrels and such? Okay. When we get into the later chapter, the later chapters where um, they're out. Actually, after Moby, some of the uh, the illustrations are. Well, here's a here's a bit of Moby. Getting ready to chomp down on a boat. <laughs> there are some full color ones here, if I can uh, find them. 
Well, here, here's another couple of illustrations here. They're, they're getting into the thick of it. And, and of course, they're that distinctive Kent style, powerful and stark, yep. Yep. Uh, that really, that really uh, uh, convey uh, nature really well. Uh, and of course, he, he was at his best when he was doing, uh, he was portraying the, the starkness of nature, whether it's the far north in the Arctic or out on the ocean where you have a, a limited palette. Uh, and uh, you know the, the black and white uh, engravings are, are just are just wonderful. And and I would in invite anybody who uh, uh, is interested in in Kent or interested in book value or goes to garage sales and, and want to be inspired that you know that maybe they can turn something over for a quarter sometime, uh, just to go on eBay or uh, one of the used book uh, um, sites and search for Rockwell Kent materials. And take a look and s if you can find a Lakeside Edition press of any of his works, but particularly the Moby Dick, and just see how many thousands of dollars they're they're going for. Um, next, I would I want just want to show you one other of the Lakeside editions, and this is his uh, Canterbury Tales. Look the, the, at this. You know, the, now Isn't we're talking. Amazing. See, the other one was a cloth mining. That's a little more around the mill. This is leather, okay? Uh, with the 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 ridges. This is this is part of the binding. This is not decoration. You'll occasionally find uh, uh, the Franklin Mint uh, does uh, Charles Dickens or something that they'll they'll. Uh, get something that looks like this with, with ridges in it, but these are actually a functional part of the binding. Uh, you know, again, you see you've got the gold, uh, the gold leaf on the, on the end, uh, on the foredge, uh, and here on, you can see again that it's, it's the uncut pages. You see, they're not all even, and that's part of the, of the style, part of the allure. Let's see if we can get an illustration here. Wow. There's the fryer. And you see it's not just black and white. You've got that, that third tone in there. Uh, so it gives it a little more rich quality. Uh, again, this is, this is Lakeside Press. So, I mean, we're, this is fine publishing and fine binding. And uh, we have some correspondence. Uh, um, between Kent and uh, his agent and uh, the head of the press, the publisher. Oh, you do? Oh, uh, and talking about what kinds of paper and, and, well, this one isn't quite bright enough, go to this paper mill and get this specific grade of paper because for the drawings that I'm doing, that I'm planning for this book, that, that particular paper, the contrast, the, the texture of that paper will be most appropriate, and which typeface they're going to use. And uh, I mean, just down to the every last detail, and he was intimately involved in that. So he was very, it wasn't just, uh, you know, they, they sent him a contract and he shipped back a bunch of uh, drawings. He was very much involved in the process of creating these, these fine uh, additions. Now, once the fine edition was out, then they would go to you know one of the mass houses, and uh, you know you you get you get the uh, uh, you know the mass market ed edition of, of Moby Dick, and then it gets it done into other languages with uh, you know and these these are hardcover books and these are not bad quality books, uh, but these are the mass market editions that you know you or I would uh, would have purchased would have been within the range of our budget uh, in the 1930s or 40s. Uh, yeah, uh, those uh, lake sides were very expensive back then. I mean, very expensive, yes. Even even thirty or fifty dollars for a collection was was big money for it. I'm, yes, I'm not sure. I I, I should look up uh, uh, what the what the list price of of these uh, was, but they they were in that range of fifty or hundred dollars, which in in uh, today's dollars would probably be five hundred to a thousand dollars range. Uh, and and worth and worth it for the workmanship that's oh, sure. in it, because these books will. I mean, they're 70 years old, and they, you know, they look. They don't look a day old, uh, and they they will have a life expectancy of hundreds of years. 
uh, and and hundreds of reads, where where a a, uh, a mass market hardcover you might get ten reads out of, and uh, we already spoke about the paperbacks one to three reads, and you put them in the unless trash. I read them, they'll be lucky if you get through one time because I mangle books when I read them. Now, now Rockwell also was a an artistic editor, um, and he edited. Uh, a book that went through a number of editions called World Famous Paintings. And these are not just his, his work. So he was not only an artist, but he was uh, aware of art uh, and selected uh, uh, many of his favorite paintings and wrote a textbook around it, in essence, uh, that this would be a good Art 101 uh, textbook. Um, he was also uh, admired and, and became a friend of a man by the name of Louis B. Untermeyer. Uh, and any, anybody who's taken a college-level survey course of literature or poetry or uh, anything is probably familiar with uh, Louis B. Untermeyer. Was, he was a great anthologist in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, and uh, uh, he also did some uh, art survey books and always gave uh, prominence to, to Mr. Kent. Uh, obviously regarded him highly and, and they had a, a long term relationship um, now we've we've alluded to the fact that uh, that Mr. Kent was a book illustrator he actually did a great deal of cover art including for those horrible paperback books which back in the uh, 30s were kind of a novelty and there was a press and I forget the name of the press that um, uh, was kind of you know we had B movies where we had paperback books in those days were a little bit naughty uh, and uh, he it's it's very hard to collect these books we have a few of them um, but they they are First of all, they're, they're not important books like uh, Canterbury Tales or Moby Dick. Um, and they, they weren't widely distributed. Uh, they had a, you know, a limited uh, audience. Um, they were paperback books, so they tended to fall apart. So they just haven't physically survived very well. Uh, and because we're just talking about the cover art, and they're often unsigned, um, if they did make it into a library, that would not have been a piece of information that would have been um, noted by a cataloger, probably. They would have done author title, uh, and if there were internal illustrations in the book, perhaps they would have noted that. But very seldom, unless you know it's somebody who's important, do you, as a librarian cataloging a book, note that the cover art was done by Rockwell Kent. Uh, so it's very hard to turn these over. To, they're, they're out there. If you see them, you you know, if you are familiar with the style, you know it immediately. Uh, but they're they're just floating around out there. So that might be something you could pick up at a garage sale that yeah. would be a real find. Yeah, that's worth looking for. Now, George Abbey, who was a poet and uh, was a, a faculty member here for many years. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen or mentioned George Abbey's name in a long, long time, and I have to do an aside. Because on the, George was a, a loved a, animals and birds, and at any time that there would be a, an animal or a bird, a bird that was injured by the side of the road, people would call up and say, what do I do with this injured bird? And I would say, call George Abbey. Uh -huh. And George would go out in the middle of the night and take that poor sparrow home and nurse it back to health. Now we have people with a designated tile Title: Wildlife Rehabilitators. Yeah, you have to get licensed by the state. <laughs> so yeah. George was the man ah. for years. Well, he's been very good to special collections too. We have a very full collection of his publications and and uh, some of his manuscript too. Yeah, quite uh, a guy. But this, you can see, is is a cover illustration, and uh, uh, it was it's a it's a Kent uh, cover art. Uh, and he did a great deal. This is quite late. This is, I believe, a mid 1960s book. Um, well, it might be a little before that. To see what the, let's see what the date of this is. Oh, here's a, oh, and here's another great. That looks like a cat too. Another illustration there on inside the book. Uh, and we've got. Uh, uh, that's a 1966 book. Yeah. So that. 
gives us a bit of an idea. We obviously have many other items here. Uh, you know, you can just uh, pull off. Now, here's here's another example of, of books being reissued. Um, here's Wilderness in one of the original editions uh, that was published in... Uh, 1920. This is a very mm. early one. This is this is based on um, I don't, uh, his uh, winter uh, spent on one of the Aleutian Islands, and uh, uh, so the book is full of of that art and as well as his writings. This is basically his his diary uh, from that. Then you start. This is where his unique style starts to emerge, and uh, there are some of the themes, the stars and the mountains. Um, that you'll see repeated uh, over over many years in, in various contexts. There's another uh, illustration, uh, but those he gets a theme that he feels comfortable with, and he uses it in different ways. Um, we we have a, a uh, well. First, let me just show you. This is a a reprint uh, from just a year or two ago, actually '96, of that same book of the wilderness book and this is what's called that this is a paperback but there are paperbacks and there are paperbacks this is what's called a trade paperback and if if you could see uh, that in there actually these uh, it isn't just a series of loose papers they are in little folios there so this this book would probably last four five to ten reads uh, but it, it's uh, uh, still on the, on the bookshelves. You can still go to the bookstore and, and buy Kent books. Uh, but I was starting to, to mention to you that um, uh, when he was in Greenland, uh, one of the studies, one of the drawing studies he did was of a, a group of husky dogs. And there were about six or eight huskies uh, who were very, very much wolf-type wolf huskies uh, lying down, some, some sitting, some standing. Uh, and that image, which we have in a study drawing, um, reappears uh, in various places, including full-scale uh, oil paintings done 20 years later. Really? Uh, and um, there's a fellow, uh, um, uh, Fred Lewis, who is uh, preparing a film, a biography of Mr. Kent, uh, that, may, uh, that may be on... Uh, uh, either arts and entertainment or, or uh, PBS. He's been negotiating. I'm not, I don't think he's finalized. He hasn't finished making it, but uh, last I, sp I uh, contacted with him a few weeks ago, and he said that he had one one 45-minute segment done. And it was started out to be an hour program, and it's up to 90 minutes, two 45-minute chunks now. And he showed the first uh, half hour of that here at the Kent Symposium um, year before last. Uh, he has done a great job superimposing um, three or four generations of this group of huskies sitting oh. there and, you know, uh, fading in and uh, superimposing them sure. to see this exactly the same set of huskies in the same positions, uh, first just by themselves on a, a you know, pencil drawing on a piece of paper, then with mountains in the background uh, in, a, in a more charcoal gray, you know, grayscale kind of, of uh, light, and then finally uh, in a, a color uh, condition uh, on, a, on an oil painting. Uh, so it, you'll, you'll find this, uh, and I don't, I'm not enough of an art expert to know whether this is something that's common to, to many artists. Uh, uh, I had never thought of it before, repeating this, the, the theme. You know? Well, and these little elements, yes. Yeah. I mean, I know in medieval drawing that, that there were symbols uh, for various uh, things that were incorporated in, into paintings, uh, but uh, these, these elements uh, are, are something that he very much repeated uh, uh, in in illustrations, for in his ad work, uh, in the book plates, uh, you'll see the 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 if not exactly the same, a very similar kind of figure um, in over a period of of uh, many years. He just reached into the grab bag and said, "Yeah, well, that now, this one will fit here. here. That's yeah. right." <laughs> what a great idea! Listen, we could stay here and talk all day. As you know, we are good friends, and this is just. One more chapter in the life of uh, Wayne Miller, who does such a fantastic job here at Special Collections. We hope we've opened a door that will be uh, 
pass through by you and your friends from time to time. We don't mind being a window here on our little corner, but we'd like to have you come and touch the books and feel them because there's nothing quite like being there. Right, and I hope uh, people will remember the special collections is open to the public, and uh, you you don't have to be a, a, a well-known researcher to come and and look at the materials and gain something from them. This is a real treasure, and so are you, Wayne Miller. Thanks again. Thank you so Gordon. much. Thanks to the other folks who joined us earlier in this program, and thanks to you, the viewers all across Northern New York and wherever this might be shown, for your support. Who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.